Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, nice to see you again and uh, a new face as well. Uh, now, in this lecture, I want to focus specifically on public health interventions. And I want to consider the economic evaluation of public health interventions. These pictures, you might think, what has this got to do with public health? Well, there is a clue there, the commonality of the moustache. Uh, I don't know if Movember has become large in Japan, but in Europe and the United States, Movember, uh, or Moustache November, uh, has become quite a movement. Uh, a movement about raising awareness about uh, prostate cancer in men. Uh, I suppose it's based on the idea that it's men who have moustaches, but uh, I don't think facial hair is that discriminatory. Some women also can benefit. But anyway, the idea is that uh, men who don't normally have a moustache in November should not shave. Now, Patu, you'll have to go the other direction and shave, perhaps, but uh, those who, who don't usually have a grow moustache will, will stop shaving and grow a moustache. And uh, within a week or two, look quite ridiculous. But this is how it raises awareness, because all their colleagues see them, their friends see them, their family sees them, uh, and the linkage is made. So that's why I've got this, this picture with all these moustaches. It is a public health intervention of sorts. That then got me to thinking, how on earth would we evaluate this campaign? How would we evaluate Movember? And uh, that would be very difficult. And, and in a way, this is a characteristic of a lot of public health interventions. They are not straightforward to evaluate. And we can contrast that with things like a new drug. Now, there are challenges in evaluating a new drug. Definitely there are challenges. And we've seen some of these this week already. The challenge of extrapolating survival. The challenge of valuing time spent in different health states. But the challenges with public health are even greater. So, in outline, what I'm going to do is review some of these challenges, the challenges involved if you want to undertake an economic evaluation of a public health intervention. And then in the second half of the lecture, I want to consider the question, are public health interventions somehow different when it comes to the economic evaluation? Are, are, are they just the same as evaluating new drugs or something like that? Or are they significantly different? And if so, how are they different? And I'm going to focus particularly on immunization programs as, as a, a vehicle to try and understand the extent to which public health interventions might be different from other health technologies. So that's the territory we're going to cover. So, what might the challenges be? Well, I think the first observation to make is that public health interventions are often um, more complex interventions than, for example, a new drug. A new drug, as an intervention, tends to be fairly straightforward. All right, there's a decision about what dosage it's going to be at, What's the frequency of uh, taking the drug? There's questions about how you monitor the response. But the intervention itself, typically, is a fairly simple one. This is not generally the case in public health. In public health, it's much more likely that the intervention will have different elements to it. It will be quite complex. And I'll look at some examples of this shortly. 
Uh, so, for example, I'll look at a, a case of uh, a mass media campaign to uh, increase smoking cessation, to encourage people to give up smoking. And that will highlight how the intervention itself is, is not particularly straightforward. It's also the case that not only is the, are the interventions themselves more complex, the outcomes that we anticipate are also more complex. Now, again, comparing with uh, new drugs, the new drug, we're anticipating some change in the patient's health, possibly improving survival, possibly improving health status, so putting the patient in a, a better health state. But that's usually it. It's a change in health. That's what we're looking for. Now, with uh, public health interventions, there can be much wider range of effects that are of interest. So it's not just the interventions are more complex, it's the range of outcomes, what the in interventions might achieve are more complex. And I've got an example coming up where we look at what might sound a strange public health intervention, but uh, a change in street lighting, street lighting. And maybe not the change you expect. You might anticipate the change might be to have more street lights. This particular intervention we'll look at was to have less street lighting. So we'll get to that in a minute. So that's the first point to make. Now, I'm not saying all public health interventions are more complex, but I'm saying there's a tendency for them to be more complex. I'm not saying that the outcomes are always more complex, but there's a tendency for the outcomes to be more complex. Second observation to make is with public health interventions, attribution is probably more of an issue. In other words, the extent to which we can say these effects we have observed are because of the intervention, the result from the intervention. We can attribute the effects to the intervention. That is harder to do quite often in the public health field. Again, if we compare it with drugs, it's actually relatively easy to attribute the effect to the drug. And that's because frequently we'll set up a randomized controlled trial in order to investigate how well the drug works. And we randomize half of our patients to taking the new drug and half to whatever's usual, usual care. And because we've randomized, we can be fairly confident any difference we observe is because of, it's, it is an effect of the new drug. It is attributable to the new drug. Now that sort of direct link is much harder to establish frequently with, um, with public health interventions. And we'll see that in a few examples. So that's so far, increased complexity, increased challenge in establishing that what were the effects that were due to the intervention. Another feature of evaluations in uh, public health are we tend to see a much wider range of study designs. Uh, and that's probably because it's quite difficult, sometimes impossible, to have a, a randomized trial in public health. Uh, part of the challenge there is the uh, public health f that frequently doesn't have an individual focus. And if, it doesn't, if an intervention doesn't have an individual focus, randomization of the recipients becomes much harder. It might be that randomization is still possible when we're evaluating public health interventions, 
but it doesn't happen very often. And the reason it doesn't happen very often is we don't seem to regulate public health. Now again, we can compare that with drugs, new drugs, or new device, new medical devices, or possibly new diagnostic procedures. These tend to be highly regulated. I mean, particularly new drugs. We put huge energies into regulating new drugs and trying to establish, uh, is there evidence of benefit and does the that benefit justify any increased risk as a consequence of the new drug. And so a lot of effort goes into establishing the safety of new, new therapies. Public health, it doesn't. There's no real regulator there. We certainly don't have an equivalent of the EMA, European Medicines Agency, or in the United States, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. There isn't a body like that who oversees public health interventions. You, I guess as a public health doctor or something, you could try anything. <laughs> I don't, I don't, look, because no one's going to, well, if you, you need some resources to try it, but it doesn't seem to be regulated. So I think that has an effect on study design. But I think a bigger one is randomization is just hard to achieve. Final observation here, I think is a, one that really just applies across the board in healthcare. It's not just public health interventions. It also obviously applies new drugs, new procedures, and that is the uh, proximate effect of an intervention almost always needs to be modeled in terms of some more useful measure of outcome. And over quite a long time period. So in public health, for example, suppose the intervention was to try and reduce smoking um, prevalence in the community. Now you could, the short term or proximate outcome, if it's successful, is a reduction in the amount of smoking or number of smokers, proportion of smokers. But we're not really interested in that as such. It's the benefits we get from reduced levels of smoking. Things like um, reduction in cardiovascular risk, which then leads to ultimately reduction in stroke, reduction in myocardial infarction, etc. And even then, we're not just interested in how many strokes we'll prevent or how many heart attacks we prevent. We're interested in what's the consequences of preventing strokes. And so there'll be patients living longer, patients in better health states than they otherwise would have been. And so it's really quite common that the approximate effect, the immediate consequence of an intervention, when we're doing evaluation, needs to be modeled so that we can predict what's going to happen to some more relevant outcome, such as patient survival or um, health changes in health state. Now, that is not just a feature of public health interventions. Of course, that's a feature of things like new drugs as well. You know, the new drug lowers cholesterol, fine but we're not interested in lower cholesterol as such. We're interested in lower cholesterol because for some patients that's then going to reduce their risk of things like stroke. And then the reduction in stroke has consequences for health. So that one um, wasn't so much a difference between public health and other health care. Continuing with the challenges, it's going to be important when we evaluate public health interventions to have some sort of standard unit of account or way of measuring outcome. 
Otherwise, we're not going to be able to compare different public health interventions. So uh, if, if we don't standardise our measure of outcome, and if, if we have different outcomes for different interventions, how do we know which intervention represents better value? We don't. So we do, we do need to standardise. Now, I think, and again, that is the same as for things like looking at new drugs. I think there is a difference, though. And I think the difference is this. It appears that perhaps monetary valuation is a bit more useful or has greater potential when we're evaluating public health interventions than possibly when we're looking at uh, new drugs. Now, with new drugs, there, well, the standard that has emerged is to use things like the cost per additional quality um, produced. The quite powerful reasons why we don't use money. And in the presentation on Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, I ran through a lot of the challenges of using money as a means of uh, valuing health outcomes. In the Public health field, however, there seems to be a much greater willingness to consider monetary valuation as an approach. And I think the reason for this is there's a much wider range of effects. So uh, with a new drug, as I've said, perhaps the main effect or the only effect is some impact on the patient's health. But with a public health intervention, and we'll see this by way of example shortly, there's many possible different effects that we're interested in and interested in achieving. And once you've got multiple effects, maybe something like the Quali or DALI becomes less useful or becomes harder to measure everything in terms of the Quali or DALI. And perhaps it then becomes easier, or the, the um, argument for using money as a standard becomes greater. Okay, so a little bit more about complexity. Even simple interventions can have complex impacts. And so it's generally important and necessary to set boundaries on your evaluation. You have to decide what effects are you going to include, which effects are you not going to include. Uh, sometimes it's just be impossible to try and include everything. You also have to decide what time period you're going to consider. Again, there's a possible dis difference here between public health and other health interventions, possibly the time periods might be potentially longer when we're looking at populations rather than individuals. As I've said, quite often, quite frequently, public health interventions will not be simple. We're going to look at an example shortly where it couldn't be simpler. Um, uh, I'm going to look at speed limits at one point. We just lower the speed limit. Very simple intervention in principle, but then it could have complex effects. But as I say, many times public health interventions are far from simple. They're quite complex. Now, this adds additional challenges because when your co intervention is complex, it becomes an issue which bits of the intervention are providing the benefit. Now, to repeat, this isn't a problem when we're testing a new drug. The new drug is, is a simple intervention. We don't have to ask ourselves, we don't even have to ask ourselves why it works. If it does work, good. But we don't even have to understand why the drug works. But if we have a complex intervention with 
different elements, it becomes a very natural and important question, which bits of this intervention are, as it were, doing the work? Which bits of the intervention are achieving the outcomes? Because then you may want to um, adjust the intervention, put more emphasis on some elements than another. So with public health, what we quite often have is a process evaluation as well as an evaluation of outcomes. Because frequently uh, there is complex processes going on. So this is a bit small. Of course, if it was bigger, I couldn't show it. Um, this is a, a healthcare intervention. Um, if you can read this on your handout, you don't need glasses. But I can take you through it. Uh, this was developed by a colleague of mine uh, at the School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, um, Rebecca Steinbach. And what she's tried to trace out are what she's described as the public health impacts of reduced street lighting. Now, this is a real policy. Uh, I suspect primarily driven by a desire to save money. I suspect. But if you reduce street lighting, you're not just going to save money. You're going to have a lot of different effects. And the issue then becomes the aggregate of these effects how does, how does that compare to the money you save? So everything is about this reduced street lighting. Where to start? Well, what do we first of all think of if we reduce street lighting? What would you think of first of all? Crime. Crime. That's interesting because that's what a lot of people immediately think of. They think if we reduce street lighting, probably going to be more crime, or if not actually more crime, more fear of crime. So we've got that, reduced street lighting, darker streets. So darker streets, fear of crime, um, actually perhaps more crime. It's not crime, but another thing you might think of is road traffic accidents, if, if street lighting is poorer. Uh, maybe if you were old and infirm, you would have come up, first of all, with falls and things like that. Increased likelihood of falling. But it's not just that. It's things like fear of falling, fear of tripping, is then going to affect people's behaviour. And so it's going to be changes in mobility. And maybe some individuals, because they're fearful of falling, or slipping, go out less often at night. Or crime, actual increases in crime, or the thought that crime might increase could lead to, again, changes in behavior. Now, this is going to have an effect potentially on nighttime economy. If people are not going to go out so much, Shops that are open late who make money from selling things later on at night are going to start doing less well. If there is more crime, or indeed if you fear more crime, people may then start spending more on um, their own security. So what started as an attempt to save some money by reducing the lighting is now leading to other people using more resources to compensate. So you could imagine a situation, indeed, where the lighting is coming down, the brightness, and immediately people start in installing more lights themselves. So you stop public lighting and increase private lighting. Um, what else will be effects? Well, energy use affected. That's, uh, that may even be um, one of the reasons. 
for introducing it, but which may then have implications for GHG as greenhouse gas emission. Um, so benefits there possibly, uh, smaller carbon imprint. Flora and fauna. If we've got less lighting, this might encourage different sorts of animals or creatures to inhabit particular areas. Now, depending how you feel about different creatures, this may be a good thing or a bad thing. But it's not all bad. What about some health effects? Now, the suggestion is sometimes um, we have too much artificial light and as a consequence, it's disruptive to people's um, circadian rhythms and people's sleep patterns are influenced. And so the suggestion, indeed, this is a suggestion that ultimately there can be impacts on diseases such as cancers, diabetes, heart disease, and so on. A little bit more exotically is this bit here. Reduce the street lighting and suddenly we seem to have starry nights. Now I don't know about Kyoto, I haven't looked up at the sky at night, but I guess Kyoto is a bit like London. You can't see any stars. It, there's too much na artificial light. So, um, interest in astronomy is possibly not great. When you look up and see the stars, maybe you do begin to think about, oh, I wonder if that's Orion or is that Mars or whatever. You take an interest. Um, perhaps there's impacts on sort of spirituality. Anytime I do get the chance to see a genuinely starry night, I suddenly realize how small, insignificant, not just I am, but we are. Now, when you don't see these stars, you're just a bit less likely to think about that. So this might have impacts on feelings about where you live and how you regard the, the, the local area. We touched on most of them, yeah. So there's the crime, there's road traffic, there's some health, some things to do with being to actually see the sky, energy use changes and consequences. Now, once you start looking at that sort of wide range of potential consequences or effects from a rather simple change, changing the lighting of making the streets a bit darker, you begin to see how this is quite hard to evaluate and you have to you have to put boundaries around it. So um, I imagine if you wanted to evaluate reduced street lighting, you're probably going to say, well, this is interesting, the starry nights, but I'm not going to include it. On the other hand, you might say, well, that's an interesting one. We could ask people's willingness to pay to be able to see, see, see the planets and the stars. I guess the sort of crime nexus you're definitely going to want to include. Uh, I think there's a real interest in road traffic as well. And of course, both crime and road traffic have potential health consequences. These health consequences also would be of interest, although how easy or difficult are they going to be to establish the link between reducing street lighting and changes in impact on these health states. In a way, crime's a bit easier. Uh, I mean, there's still challenges, but you can, um, you, you can see your way to... Uh, one expects a change in crime levels will be fairly immediate following a change in, in lighting. Uh, these health consequences may be much s slower changes. So what would you do? Would you just say, it's too complicated. I'm not going to do it. 
Nice idea, but I'm not going to do it. That's, that's an example. Okay, let's have another example. And co it's coincidentally, it's some work I've done with the same researcher. Um, this was a cost benefit analysis of 20 mile per hour speed limits. Uh, I'm afraid I'm the generation in, in Britain who grew up with miles and kilometers are always a bit difficult for us because of my generation. I think this is about 32 kilometers, 35 kilometers per hour. I don't know. It's that sort of, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I don't want to be too specific. I guess you use kilometers in Japan, do you? Yeah. Okay, it's, let's call it 35 kilometers. Um, in, in city areas, that was the idea. And so, um, again, it's a real policy that to, they wanted to have evaluated. And the idea was through um, changing the environment, you can do what's called traffic calming. You can slow down traffic. Now, one thing you can do is change the speed limit. Now, I suspect that works in Japan. If you say the speed limit is now 30 instead of 40, I imagine people here slow down. Britain is not really like that. You can change the speed limit and some people will slow down, but many won't. But there's a lot of other things you can do as well through the design of, uh, of, of the road layout. And you can narrow roads and things like that. You can um, put, put in what we call sleeping policemen. A sleeping policeman is a, a bump in the road, a speed bump. And that helps encourage people to go more slowly. So there's various things you can do. So um, what we looked at in this research was um, there were, there were parts of London where they had introduced traffic calming measures. They had introduced um, attempts to reduce the speed limit. And they did this at different points in, over time. So what we did was what's called an interrupted time series. You looked at, over time, um, areas which the, the traffic hadn't been calmed and then some set of policies or investments were made to try and calm the traffic and then you looked at the effect over time. This is called interrupted time series. And what we're trying to do here was then also control for all the other factors which might give rise to differences in casualty rates. So we're, what we're monitoring over time is the number of collisions, the number of pedestrians injured, the number of motorists injured. But of course, it's not just the speed limit or, or other related traffic calming that influences casualty rates. Um, in the UK, probably in several countries, not just the UK, over time, there's been a secular decline in driving under the influence of alcohol. If we go back in time, it was much more common for people with alcohol in the bloodstream to still drive. It's become less common over time. Now, that's going to be a problem for your evaluation because if there's changes happening to casualty rates anyway, when you introduce um, traffic calming, you might um, mistake some change for a, ch a change that would have happened anyway. So you've got to, in, in, in trying to um, establish how well this intervention is working, you've got to be able to try and control for all the other factors, such as the underlying rate of change um, in um, road traffic accidents.
You then also face a problem about any change you observe attributing it to your, your new speed limit. Now, if it occurs directly after you introduce your speed limit, you feel more confident that change in casualties, accidents, can be, can be attributed to the change in speed limit. But how long is it likely that that will be the case? So what about three months after the speed limit has changed? Will it still be having an effect? Or is any change that observed three or six months later, is any change likely to be for some other reason? And so in our study, we assumed the changes, if there are going to be any changes, would take place all within the first year. And after that, um, there wouldn't be additional changes as a consequence of your change in the speed limit. Now, we, we have this, this problem um, of attribution as well when we look at new drugs. For example, what we quite often find is patients can take a new drug and it appears to change their health state and then um, they stop taking it, possibly because of adverse effects or possibly because they progressed. But even after they stop, the patients who had taken the drug and stopped quite often appear to do better than those who never took the drug. So the, the challenge there is how much of the benefit after you stop taking a drug can you attribute to the drug? And it's, it's not uncommon for the, if we think in quality terms, the quality gains from the patients after they stopped taking the drug seem to be greater than the quality gains while they were taking the drug. Now, your intuition is this can't quite be right. You try and think what mechanism is giving rise to it? Um, well, it's something similar here. Um, how long after a change, after some intervention, how long can you continue to attribute um, any changes to, to that intervention? So you've got that challenge. Looked at, oops, sorry, graphically, something like this. <coughs> so you, in, you intervene at the sort of zero just now, and what you're having to do, uh, we're looking here at casualties per kilometer per year. That's our, our sort of target we're trying to affect. We're trying to reduce the number of casualties per kilometer per year. So there's various challenges we've got. One is, if nothing had happened, if we hadn't introduced traffic calming, what would have happened to casualty rates? Now, they could have been at this level here and just continued unchanging. On the other hand, as I say, there are quite often factors out there leading to some underlying or background rate of change. One factor I mentioned already is that individuals are, um, fewer individuals are intoxicated with alcohol while in charge of a motor vehicle. And so there's some sort of background rate there's also other changes that have been taking place. Uh, mo motor vehicles are getting safer. Various safety devices over time. Um, increasing proportion of vehicles have airbags. Um, brake systems are more effective than they used to be. Uh, maybe tires are better than they used to be, etc. So in this study, we had to first of all make some what we call a guess, estimate, an estimate about what the background rate of change was likely to be. Now, of course, there is some evidence to base that on. We can look at long-term casualty changes in casualty rates over time 
and, tr and try and work out what the rates seem to be changing at. Of course, that just tells us what the current rate of change is. It just tells us this rate here. We, but we have to go further than that. We have to say, will it continue? How long will it continue? Five years? Ten years? And again, it's rather difficult to know. So, um, the areas where they are focusing traffic calming were areas with relatively high casualty rates, higher than the average. And we then are, are making an estimate about what would have happened if we hadn't intervened. And so if we hadn't intervened by traffic calming, we're assuming the casualty rates per kilometre per year would have gone on falling anyway, uh, falling at the same rate as this background rate. Now, by analysing casualty rates over time with this interrupted time series, we can then look at, compare casualty rates before the intervention with casualty rates after the intervention. And that will give us an estimate of the change in casualty rates. And this drop here. Now, that's very helpful, but the question is, is it going to, is the, is the difference going to be constant over time or not? Or is, the, in effect, the benefit of the intervention, is it going to taper? For example, do motorists respond initially quite a lot to the new speed limit, the change in the design of the roads, etc., more enforcement activity? But do they then, over time, begin to drift back to how they used to drive anyway? Another problem, if you introduce traffic calming, will motorists still drive the same route they drove before, the same frequency they drove before, or will they in fact change their journey to avoid the traffic calming? So do you then end up with more casualties on the uncalmed roads. So it's worked on the roads that you focused on, but you've just shifted the problem to the other parts. Well, there's no, there's no right answers to any of this. These are, all the, these are the difficulties of trying to evaluate what at first sight seems quite simple. Let's reduce speed limits. It doesn't really matter, but it, it appeared in our analysis to be fairly cost effective. Um, but it's sensitive to how long you assume the benefit goes on. Because what's happening, of course, I should emphasize this, you're sort of incurring a lot of the costs now. You're changing the layout of roads. You're using publicity to tell people about the change speed limit. You're employing police over time to do more monitoring of speed limits, etc. You incur the costs now, but the benefits are in the future. And so depending on how long you assume the benefits, the reduced casualties go on for, that has a big effect on your estimate of cost effectiveness. Now, these problems are, in a way, the same problems we have when we're evaluating a new drug. But new drugs, we can, we can do a trial. We can control for a lot of factors. OK, uh, another example. Um, this was health improvements, uh, environmental health improvements. It was cleaning up areas that used to be industrial areas where back in time, industry had been somewhat reckless about how they, how, how they treated their waste products. So this was actually in a, 
um, part of um, Sicily called um, Gela and Priolo. And they were, to some extent, ongoing industrial sites, but they had been historically what we call heavy industry. And uh, these industries, <coughs> things like chemicals, steel production, etc., these industries used to generate quite dangerous waste products, which back in time, people didn't seem to care too much about and uh, were a bit reckless in their disposal. And so a key, key issue here was one of attribution. <coughs> if, we, um, if we look at these heavily polluted sites, it's quite clear that on the health indicators, there are many, many more health problems for local residents. So it's quite clear that those people who live in areas um, affected by the environmental pollution have poorer health. But what's not so clear is how much of their poorer health is attributable to the environmental pollution. Maybe the people who live in these areas are poorer than people who live in non-polluted areas. And maybe it's their poverty that causes the poorer health and not the living in the polluted area, for example. So it's a, it's a question of attribution. Now again, we can't, we can't rewrite history. We can't sort of randomize people 20 years ago and uh, randomly allocate some of these poor people to live in the polluted area, randomly allocate some of them to live in a less polluted area, and similarly for the less poor people, it can't be done. So it's the problem of, um, predominantly a problem of randomizing, or the, we can't do anything about randomization. And so the issue then is how much of the poorer health, and it's definitely the case, there's good evidence that health is poorer in these areas, how much of that poor health is attributable to the industrial pollution. Another problem is if you do clean up the site, how long will it be before we start seeing improvements in health? Because for the first few years, no, no matter how clean the site is, you're going to be living with the, the legacy, the historical legacy, the ill health because of what happened before. And so how long will it be, sometimes called a cessation lag, how long before we'll start seeing health benefits? How long do people have to live in the cleaner environment for a health benefit to start showing through. Um, how rapidly will some maximum annual benefit be achieved? So what's quite likely is initially there's no benefit for a few years and then the benefits begin to build up over time. And at some point they'll reach a maximum. And then how long do they stay at the maximum? How long before they start declining? How long will intervention produce benefits? Now this raises a, an issue I haven't mentioned, but does come into economic evaluation quite widely. And that's something called discounting. Discounting. Now as individuals and as a society, we do behave as if we value benefits in the near future much more highly than benefits in the distant future. We do this as individuals. We certainly also do it as a society. We want the good things now. We don't want to wait for them. If we have to wait for them, the longer we wait, the lower value we attach to those future benefits. And just the same with costs, but it's in reverse. 
What we'd rather do as individuals, it appears, is delay the cost. Rather than have pay the cost now, if we could pay the cost in 10 years time, that's more attractive. Now, in the jargon of economics, what's that, that's called having a positive discount rate. Now, in economic evaluation, we, we, uh, we formalize this. We recognize that there is this preference for benefits in the near future over further future, uh, preference for costs further future over current or near costs. And we formalize it with a discount rate. So we calculate the costs and effects, costs and benefits of an intervention, and then we look at the timing of the costs, the timing of the benefit, and we multiply them by a, a discount factor. Uh, now, I don't want to get into the technical aspect of it. Um, suffice to say, um, while that seems a good idea, what rate should you discount at? So if you discount at too high a rate, you're going to distort the relative costs and benefits or costs and effects. But if you discount at too low a rate, you're also going to introduce a bias. So um, it's an additional complication. Now this, this um, issue of discounting is also an issue in any economic evaluation of any health technology. So we're looking at a new drug, for example, the same issues can arise. Typically we incur the costs now, but the benefits may be in the more distant future. And the question is, if we, how do we make the stream of costs comparable to, to stream of benefits when they've got different timing? Uh, and so choice of discount rate is important. I'm conscious I seem to be doing all the talking this morning. Is this a Friday phenomenon? I'm just getting more benefits. Some hot outcomes are also complicated. Then we need to benefits then. How will we? Oh, if there are no benefits, it's a lot easier because then if it's only costs and there's no benefits, why would you want to do it? So um, if there's really no benefits, life is easier. Um, well, it's not, it's not better, it's just easier because we know the answer. If, we, if, if we're going to have costs but no benefit, why do it? But if there are benefits but they are in the further future, we tend to look at them as less valuable and the further away they are. Now, as a group, you will probably have quite a low discount rate or low rate of time preference because what characterizes all of you is a willingness to invest in yourself. Because you're involved in the university system, you have invested a huge amount of time and money, but time in developing yourself. Now, the people who aren't here, that's a very large number, but uh, the people who don't go to university, they don't study extra years, the people who leave, say, school whenever they can, they'll typically have a higher discount rate because one factor that's affecting their behavior is they don't, they're not willing to wait for the benefits of being better trained, better educated. They would rather get out now and work now and get those benefits. Now, I do realize there's other reasons why you spend a lot of time in education, you know, um, parental influence, for example, uh, or, or, or whatever reason. But uh, one factor is your ability to give up and to, to, to incur costs now that is not working in the market, labor market, um, spend time studying, um, be poorer now in order to be wealthier in the future. Now, it may not be that that's how you've looked at your decision, but from an economic perspective, it's arguably what's been going on. 
And so that's why I imagine you as a group have relatively low discount rate. A low discount rate means you still attach a high weight to the future. If you had a high discount rate, that's equivalent to attaching a low weight, weight to the future. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave discounting just now. Um, of all the subjects economists ever talk about, discounting is the one that I've almost always found students have the most difficulty with. Okay, so that's um, an environmental health improvement one. I think this might be the last, no it's not. <laughs> it's not last example. I've got some smoking cessation ones coming. This is a, a recent one. Um, that I've involved with colleagues looking at. And this is looking at indoor air pollution in primary schools. Now, when I first came across it as a, as a topic, I thought, indoor air pollution in primary... I was very naive. I somehow thought, well, we're inside. The pollution's outside. We're inside. What's the problem? And then as you begin to learn a little bit about the topic, and it's a bit obvious when you think about it. Indoor air pollution is very closely related to outdoor air pollution. Of course, there can be some additional sources. You know, if we had um, a wood burning stove, for example, we would then have more um, indoor air pollution. And what this study was looking at was the impact particularly of NO2 um, nitrous dioxide, I guess it is. Uh, it's, now, n nitrous dioxide is not the only thing in the air which is bad for um, exacerbating children's asthma, but um, it's one of the main things in air that causes these problems. And so there was a large European study looking at this issue across many, many different schools in many, many different countries and trying to establish what the relationship was um, between levels, indoor levels of NO2, nitrous dioxide, and the number of asthma attacks or exacerbations that school children were experiencing. And so the main aim of this part of the study was to identify the benefit from reducing exposure to NO2. And in a way, this highlights um, one of the points I was trying to make earlier, and that is, in this area, there's possibly a greater role for monetary valuation. Because one, one way of doing this analysis, this economic evaluation, one approach would have been to try and translate everything into qualities. And so you think, right, what is the effect of different levels of NO2 on number of asthma attacks? What is the consequence for qualities, quality adjusted life years, of fewer asthma attacks? And you could do it that way. But that link is quite, um, that link between the asthma attack and the quality impact is quite quite a tricky one. Instead, what we opted to do was look at willingness to pay. And so we had a separate study to look at the willingness to pay to reduce the risk of experiencing uh, an asthma attack or exacerbation. Because if we could establish the value to individuals of reducing the risk of exacerbations, we could combine that with the information on the relationship between NO2 levels and the rate of uh, asthma attacks. This study was unusual. It went one step further. It asked children their willingness to pay to reduce the risk of asthma attacks, and it asked their parents. Uh, now, we don't usually ask children, and it's 
quite challenging to do it, but um, we got answers that seemed fairly sensible. Indeed, the children's answers made a lot more sense than the parents' answers, the willingness to pay statements. The children gave really quite considered responses. The adults, by contrast, the answers they were giving to the willingness to pay questions, the sort of questions that we talked about, I talked about on Wednesday afternoon. Um, the adult answers were a bit more random, I think, but the children's were, seemed very sensible. <clears throat> right. Okay, then just a couple more examples. I'm trying, in each of these examples, I'm trying to find, bring out some of the aspects that maybe makes public health interventions potentially different. <clears throat> this was looking at a mass media-led anti-smoking campaign, and I got quite a shock when I looked, <laughs> well, back. It was 21 years ago that <laughs> I published this study. Uh, at least you were all born, that's good. Um, I, well, maybe not all of you. Maybe the cameraman wasn't born. Right, 1997. Different world back then. Smoking was even more popular then than it is uh, now. I've noticed um, walking around Kyoto in the street, I don't see people smoking or indeed vaping. But then I go into a restaurant and suddenly everyone's smoking. Because in very, uh, in the few areas, uh, like, it's oh, so it's not allowed in public in the street? Well, I noticed in my hotel, there's a sort of death cubicle just beside reception, uh, where you can walk in and uh, smoke. Uh, so in the street, you're not allowed to smoke. You should keep a little smoke, because when it's like, it's getting more strict in Japan. All oh, right. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, there's been policies to try and reduce smoking for a number of years in Britain. Uh, this one was a study, uh, intervention in Scotland. And uh, it was a, an example of a complex intervention. So um, the intervention had these elements. There was mass media advertising, um, particularly television adverts, and also posters and adverts in the, the newspaper or press. To this day, I can still remember many of the posters. Um, the, the, they had one where they had a, um, a cigarette and a bullet. And you know, the bullet, it said, fast and cigarette slow, you know, as, as a means of killing yourself. Another poster they had was a, uh, a trolley in a hospital and a sign saying, reserved for smokers. This bed is reserved for smokers. So it was, it was an attempt to be quite hard hitting. Some of the TV adverts had um, a, a sort of tearful mother lying in bed looking very ill, pleading with her son, don't be like her, don't smoke. So it was a real attempt. These days we take it almost for granted that you know, advertising will be a bit more sort of aggressive, but, but at least back then in Britain in the 1990s, it was quite unusual to take this much more powerful line in trying to persuade people to stop smoking. <clears throat> so there was the advertising, and part of what they were advertising, well, part of it was the evils or dangers of smoking, but also they were advertising a helpline called Smoke Line. And so this was a free telephone service where you could phone up and get um, support advice about quitting smoking. And as well as the free helpline, if you phoned the helpline, one of the things they offered you was a specially designed booklet, so information, um, called You Can Stop Smoking. And this booklet was providing um, practical advice and encouragement to stop smoking. So complex intervention, if it worked, 
you couldn't really say, was it the TV adverts? Was it the posters? Was it the free helpline? Was it the booklet? Um, there was a follow-up of a random sample of those who called the smoke line and uh, almost a thousand people were followed up. And the primary outcome was estimated as um, quitting with the direct help of smoke line. So the people that were followed up were, had contacted smoke line and they were followed up over time to see if they gave up smoking. And uh, estimates of cessation or giving up smoking was based on self-report at 12 months, 12 months later. Um, as is quite standard with economic evaluations of smoking cessation, it's not enough to know how many people gave up smoking. You know, you could calculate a cost per quitter, a cost per additional person quitting, but how much should we be willing to spend to get an additional person to quit? So, in economic valuations of smoking, or smoking reduction, there's usually an attempt to try and link giving up smoking to the health benefit. And so you're trying to, you need to predict, you need a model to predict the impact on people's health um, of uh, smoking cessation. And in this study, uh, we used a model, a Dutch model, which looked at um, various risks individuals were exposed to for things like cardiovascular disease and estimated what part of that risk was due to being a smoker. And so what part of that risk would change if you could turn someone from a smoker to an ex-smoker? And so the model um, allowed for the changes in survival as a consequence of giving up smoking. What it didn't have was any impact or any attempt to measure reduced morbidity. So uh, it's quite clear at the outset, you're m we're missing part of the benefit. Because of course, um, the benefit from smoking cessation is not just a reduced risk of death, it's uh, a reduced r risk of various morbidities. Another problem with this study was we couldn't estimate how many people would have managed to quit anyway. So we follow up people who contact the smoke line and we make an estimate of how many of them have quit. But what we don't know, so it's another example of the attribution problem, and as I say, the attribution problem is a really big problem when looking at public health interventions. What we had to do was make an assumption about how many of them would have quit anyway. Um, it's a bit like what I was talking about with the speed limit, where there's a background change taking place I mean, in the casualty rates over time. Well, similarly, with smoking cessation, there's a background quitting rate. People are giving up smoking over time. And the rate at which they're doing that is really important for an evaluation such as this because you're going to compare the quit rate in those who contacted the smoke line with this background rate. Another assumption, there's so many weaknesses in this study, but it was, as I say, 21 years ago. Another assumption was that the only people to benefit from this intervention are those that contacted the smoke line. But of course, it's mass media led, and so there's a wider population who see the posters, see the television adverts, but don't actually contact the smoke line, the helpline. But some of them, their behavior may also have been influenced. 
So there's possibility there. I haven't written it down here. There's another problem. Interestingly, a large proportion of those who contacted the smoke line were not smokers. They were the children of smokers. And so a large number of children phoned the helpline, as it were, on behalf of, or they hoped on behalf of, um, their parents. Now that is quite hard to evaluate because we did then don't, how many of those children would have been able to then convert the parents into non-smokers? We don't know. So um, quite a few um, challenges, but despite all that, it did look um, fairly cost-effective back then. <clears throat> By contrast, the second um, smoking cessation example, I'm sorry I'm pushing all my own work today, um, that's just uh, yes, unfortunate, but it's, it's easier to talk about your own work because you can kind of remember it. Other people's, you don't always remember the details. So a big weakness in that smoke line evaluation was um, we're having to assume what would have happened in terms of quitting if they hadn't been exposed to the smoke line. Alternative here was um, smoking cessation supported by text messaging. So um, people um, in their phone would be getting messages. In fact, they were getting a very high rate of messages. I think there's a danger you would just sort of go crazy. But anyway, they, they got um, fo phone messages. So the trial was called Text to Stop, um, a good trial name. And it randomized 5,800 individuals to either um, having the text message support for quitting or um, not. And uh, what we found with biochemical verification at six months. So if we didn't reply, re <clears throat> we didn't, excuse me, we didn't rely on self-report. We actually biochemically verified by testing saliva whether these individuals had um, stopped smoking. And we found <clears throat> text messaging doubled the quit rate. Now, we can say that because we're able to randomize. So we don't have to worry about making an assumption about a background quit rate because we've got a control group. The control group, we assume, are quitting at the rate that the intervention group would have quit if they'd not been exposed to the intervention. Um, for the economic evaluation, we looked at cost per life year gained and cost per quality. Quality just the life year gained um, using a Markov model. We don't have to go into that. Uh, now, economic evaluation always faces at least, at least a twin challenge of obtaining a robust estimate of the treatment effect. That's always a big challenge, but that's overcome here because we've got randomization. So we're pretty sure about this doubling of the quit rate. <clears throat> but the second challenge remains modeling the incremental benefits as a consequence of the treatment effect. So as a consequence of people quitting, what are the health benefits? And so we then have to um, ge make, generate this model that allows us to predict reduced future events, reduced stroke and things like that. Now, this sort of randomization is not generally feasible for most public health interventions. And so we're in a much harder territory usually. Okay, um, valuation challenges. I think I'm going way too slow today. Um, arguably, the valuation challenges what is the value of the health change that's generated are just the same that we experience with looking at new drugs. Mm -hmm. 
But as contrasted with new drugs, there's much less use of qualies in, in evaluating public health interventions. And I think the reason for this, um, less use of qualies, more use of money. Um, I think the reason for this is public health interventions tend to include a broader mix of outcomes. They don't just have a narrow health effect. They have potentially broader effects, as I tried to illustrate, particularly with the street lighting at the outset. And so for that reason, that maybe tips the balance a bit. Monetary evaluation becomes a bit more attractive as a methodology. OK. 12 minutes. Are public health interventions therefore different? When I, when I say are they different, do they have characteristics such that our economic methods need to change or be adapted when we are evaluating public health interventions? Now, um, I say recently, if it's about two years ago now, anyway, maybe three years ago. Um, a working group was set up by the Department of Health in England to explore this question, specifically um, in the context of vaccination programmes. What had happened was there'd been a lot of publicity about decisions about vaccination programmes, particularly meningococcal B vaccines, and As a consequence, there was a lot of questioning about the methods used to establish cost effectiveness. Now, the methods used were just exactly the same methods we generally use when looking at a new drug. And in this case, however, there was huge public concern. Um, I don't know if you have something similar in Japan, but in England, if people, the general population, don't like something, they can set up um, a sort of opposition campaign to the law and collect signatures. And if you get above so many hundred thousand signatures, Parliament must um, at least look at this concern or complaint. Well, in response to the um, initial decision making on um, men B vaccine, they, they got the biggest ever um, list of signatories saying we don't like this decision. Uh, um, it's called a petition. And so the House of Commons Petitions Committee then looked at um, this. And so as part of that, there was a desire by the Department of Health to have a working group to establish, is it appropriate to use standard economic methods to evaluate vaccination programs, or are vaccination programs somehow different? <clears throat> and in their wisdom, the Department of Health made me chair of the committee, which uh, was a great honor, but with hindsight, I'm not sure I should have said yes. So <clears throat> we had about 13 meetings we had three subgroups, and the subgroups reported to each meeting, and then eventually we reported ourselves. But um, um, terms of reference are there. But basically the question was, should we be using different methods of evaluation or, or similar methods? And we decided um, that CMIP was the acronym for the working group, that there were five method potential methodological issues. There was issues, unsurprisingly, around measuring and valuing health effects. There was issues around discounting in the time horizon. There was issues about what we call non-linearities um, in the relationship between cost and outcome. I'll explain these once I get to them. There was some question about treatment of uncertainty, and then a question about the cost effectiveness threshold. And uh, just a little bit on each of these. So measuring valuing health effects. Clearly, a lot of the health benefits are directly to those people who are vaccinated because they, they are 
better chance of avoiding disease. But there's also going to be benefits, and this does make vaccination a little bit different. Benefits to non-vaccinated people because they will face a lower risk because other people are vaccinated. So other people getting vaccinated gives you a benefit. You don't have to be vaccinated yourself to get a benefit. Um, this is in economic jargon, this is called an externality. And uh, we always in health context use vaccination as an example of externality. There was a great deal of discussion about something called a peace of mind benefit. Um, partly to vaccinated people, but also to the families themselves. The idea here being that just knowing that your child, for example, has been vaccinated is going to give you peace of mind. And that should be valued. Men B is quite possibly a little bit special here. Your, your young child can be seemingly perfectly healthy in the morning and in extreme cases, and I stress it's extreme cases, they could even be dead by the evening. But that's really extreme, but, but it can happen. And so parents were arguing, this is a sort of terrifying disease there's a vaccine that works quite well. It's not that great, but it works quite well. Of course, we must have it. And then they were arguing, it gives us peace of mind. And they're saying, well, your economic evaluation doesn't allow for our peace of mind. So that's the sort of argument they're making. Um, so they're really saying vaccination or this vaccination is different. Our working group looked at this very closely, but um, didn't buy it really. We argued people have peace of mind from knowing there's an emer accident in the emergency department um, nearby. People have peace of mind from knowing that um, if you have metastatic renal cell carcinoma, there are four or five treatments available that you could have access to. So we argued that there wasn't something completely different about vaccinations. This was a healthcare broader phenomenon. The question arose, are some qualities, qualities from immunization, are they worth more than non-immunization qualities? Now, the way the, the patient groups were talking is as if they were. They were worth more. Um, and so whatever the estimate of qualities was, quality gain from a vaccination program, we needed to sort of scale it up because some of these qualities were more important. Now, it is true that um, frequently immunization programs are directed at young children. And it is true that it has been argued that benefits to young children are more important than benefits to adults. Now, as I said, um, I lose track of which day it was, but it's probably Wednesday. There's this quite long list of reasons, Wednesday morning probably, why a quality may be worth more in some circumstances. And one of the reasons that's put forward is um, young children. Discounting time horizon. Um, the issue here is, should we use a different discount rate for immunization programs? And the argument here is, it might even be the case through say vaccination or something like that, that you eliminate a condition. And so the benefits stretch, as it were, forever. Now we've effectively eliminated smallpox, 
Well, it's a bit terrifying thinking Putin's no doubt got some access to smallpox. And, well, not just Putin, <laughs> Trump. <laughs> I think there's about five centers in the world have somewhere um, the virus still exists. But, you know, we, in principle, we can. At polio, we've been quite close to eradicating, but is it Nigeria and Pakistan, I think, provide challenges, particularly. Pakistan, particularly, in terms of getting to eradication. Well, if you had a program, you might generate a benefit that lasts forever because you've eradicated a disease. Now, if you discount at any positive rate, um, these benefits that stretch away into the future actually start to look not very important because the effect of discounting is to attach very low values to future events if they're far enough away. So I think there is an issue around um, discounting time horizon. Uh, when we think of most cases of giving people a drug treatment or whatever, the benefits stretch at most, even for a young child, stretch sort of 80, 90 years into the future. If we're thinking of some sort of intervention which might eradicate a disease, we're talking about benefits stretching hundreds, thousands of years into the future. And so the issue of what discount rate to use is quite an important topic. Non-linearities. Um, well, the way we purchase vaccines, at least in England, does suggest there's a non-linearity in that if you have a very large vaccination program, you can usually negotiate a lower price per vaccine. Um, this is much less obvious when we look at new drugs for some other condition. Uh, quantity discounts are less obvious. So there might be some factor there that makes it look a little bit different. One interesting argument, and this is one we did accept, is that if you have the vaccine program, you perhaps avoid an epidemic. And if there was an epidemic, the consequences for the NHS, the health service, and other treatments are, can be very important. It can be very disruptive for the health service. And this is a phenomenon we don't get with, with other interventions. If, you, if, you, if there's a new drug for prostate cancer, if we don't give the new drug, if we say no to it, that's not going to, as it were, cause an epidemic of prostate cancer. Possibly, however, in some immunization programs, you risk an epidemic if you don't have the program. And the epidemic then imposes costs on the health service by displacing other NHS treatments. So that was an argument we did see merit in. Uncertainty in decision making. I'm conscious of the time, and I'm almost finished. Um, with respect to vaccines, we've got a very interesting system in, uh, in England. Well, actually, it's UK wide for this. And that is we apply a test. Is it, we use a £20,000 threshold. Is £20,000 per quality gained? Does the intervention meet the £20,000 threshold? Does it generate additional qualities at a cost of up to, but not more than, 20000 If it passes that, there's then an uncertainty test. And what's asked is, what's the likelihood that the cost per quality, you know, our best estimate was less than 20, what's the likelihood that it could have a cost per quality above 30,000. And if the chance is more than 10%, we would reject the intervention. Now, this is the only instance I know anywhere in the world where there's a formal rule about how to treat uncertainty. Uh, we don't use it elsewhere in, this, in the healthcare system um, in the UK. What it's trying to do is avoid a situation where um, although something looks cost-effective, there's a substantial chance 
it, it might actually have much, much higher cost per unit of benefit. And the final issue, this is a very political one at the time and continues to be so, um, what should the cost effectiveness threshold be? Well, we said currently the cost effectiveness threshold is 20 to 30,000 pounds. This is following NICE. But there is quite a lot of evidence that the NHS can turn money into qualities, turn money into health at a much lower rate. And the best estimate we've got is a about £13,000. £13,000 per quality. That appears to be achievable in the NHS. Now, the significance of this is if you're accepting new programmes or new therapies up to £30,000 per quality, and then you're displacing NHS activity, which could have bought qualities for £13,000 you're going to make the NHS worse off. You're going to reduce health benefits. And the final example is a very simple calculation. Let's suppose the true cost per quality is £20,000. We think the evidence says it's lower than that, but let's suppose it's 20000 If you say yes to ISIS of 30000 which is the practice at NICE, for every 10 million um, pounds of additional cost, you're going to have a net loss of health. And the net loss of health is 166 qualities. So you're going to systematically make the NHS worse off in terms of the health it produces. And this is because you're using the wrong threshold. So this working group said, look, for threshold, we really should be much more realistic and use a threshold in line with the uh, evidence. Not a popular view with the pharmaceutical industry. Anyway, so in conclusion, we decided, at least with respect to vaccination programs, there wasn't enough con convincing arguments that we should use a different approach a different approach from the one we use when we evaluate pharmaceuticals. There are some differences with vaccination, immunization, but not enough to say we should be using a different set of methods. Now, maybe vaccination programs are relatively simple compared to the typical public health intervention. Uh, and so I don't want to say that what I've just said is convincing argument for using the standard economic method, but that's where we are just now. We recognize that public health interventions are more challenging to evaluate, but we think we can use our existing methods. And that's, sorry, I've overrun again. We stop there and we resume at two, one, one, one o'clock, one o'clock, definitely one. Uh, and then we finish on time this afternoon.